the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The Bible or the science of the world, your choice. I'm going to go what God says. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there's a little light in them and you can still follow them. No, it says no light. There is no light in them. And he cried with a mighty, with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of devils. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Go out before it is too late. Time is almost over. Jesus is soon to come. The spirit of persecution manifested by paganism and the papacy is again to be revealed. The image to the beast represents another religious body. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third message. Catholics? Apostate Protestants? No. Only one church have professed faith in the three angels' message, the Seventh-day Adventists, but have not been sanctified through it. They abandon their position, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy popular side. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts, these apostates are their most efficient agents of Satan. Our dear Heavenly Father, we kneel before you not worthy of being thought of as the sons and daughters of God. We pray that you will help us, for it is our choice. We pray for discernment of the Word and for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon us as we open the Word to study the truth. May we see there the light that has been preserved for us, and may we put it in use. Bless us, keep us, and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'll have a short story, very, very short story to start our uh, study with. It's titled, The Way to Heaven. And it reads like this, one Sabbath morning, a city preacher gave a message in a little country church. After the sermon, someone said to Farmer Peter, that was a fine sermon, wasn't it? Maybe, replied Farmer Peter. Why, said the friend, that man knows more about the Bible than any minister in the country. He knows a lot about Bible history and geography. Well, said Farmer Peter, maybe the trouble was with me. But you see, I thought I should hear something about the way to heaven. I only learned something about the way from Jerusalem to Jericho. You know, that is the way it is with the majority of of preachers today. Not all, but the majority. They may know a lot about the prophecy charts. They may know a lot about history. They may know a lot about the um, intricate details of a person's life, a Bible character. But they fail in knowing the important, most important thing. And that's what we're going to be looking at and studying today, is that most important thing. So let's look at the basic concept of all religion. 
the basic concept of all religion. All religions begin with a conception of God. And I mean all religions. I don't care if they're Buddhist, they're Mormon, they're Pentecostal, they're Hindus, they are pagans, they are papists, they all believe with some sort of a conception of God. Now their gods may be different, but they all have a conception of God. And their religion is molded and dominated by that conception of God. It is thus with the Christian religion as well. The first statement in the Bible is, In the beginning, God. It is not only the first statement in the book, but is the first in importance of all things in the book. For the most important truth of the Bible for us to know is the fact of God. After the fact of God, the next in order of importance is what kind of God? Whatever sort our God is, of that sort our religion will be. It cannot be Otherwise, our concept of God. Therefore, everything we read in the Bible will be understood in harmony with our concept of God. Now, if we believe that God is a God of love, not a vengeance, oh no, but just a God of love, then everything that we read in the Bible, we will see through those rose-tinted glasses of love. But if we believe on the exact opposite, that, that the God of the Bible is a mean and vengeful, hateful ruler who's just sitting there waiting to just drive you into the ground, then everything you read in the Bible you will feel as though you are condemned and destined to hell. You see, every, our concept of what kind of a God we have, if we start on that false foundation of whatever it may be, we will come to conclusions from the Word. So do you see and understand why there are so many people today that are preaching, so many preachers that are teaching and preaching, and so many individuals who have this belief and that belief? It is all because of this first problem. Their concept of God started at a wrong place. For instance, love will be understood to mean whatever we find of love in our concept of God. No, or excuse me, one finds no love in a stick, a stone, a star, a flower, or a tree. Neither can we receive help from them, nor ideals. We can receive these only from a person. Really to sum this up, our beliefs, our belief system, reflects our philosophy of God. So let's take this a step further and evaluate and see what God would have us to believe as to our concept of God. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Our conception of the original origin of all things will be according to our idea, idea of God. All theories of origin may be placed in two classes. First, 
that all things came into being by his creative act. And second, that things came to be without, excuse me, that things came to be without him. So there's one of those two. Either things came into being by his great creative act, or that things came to be without him. Belief in his creative acts depends upon belief in his personality. Belief that things came to be without him of themselves is only the logical conclusion to reach when one does not believe in his personality. If there is no personal God, there could be no creation as set forth in Genesis. And we have no explanation of origins except that the development of development alone without God. So what I'm describing to you is one of two things. We have the belief of creation and we have the belief of evolution. One of the two. And every single religion falls under one of those two, except as we are going to learn, there's actually a group that try to amalgamate those two. The two conceptions of the origin of these things are contrary to each other. And the ideas to which they lead are likewise contrary. So if we try to intermingle creation and evolution, it's not like a good gear that fits. They don't work. They won't fit. And yet, man tries to do this very thing. To explain, the doctrine of creation teaches that man was made perfect and upright by the act of God. That from such a sinless state he fell into transgression. In which he needs redemption to restore him to the original perfect condition. And this redemption was provided through the gift of God in his Son. So we have a horizontal line at an elevated point on this drawing. And that is the level of us being created perfect. That's Genesis 1 creation. Then man fell into sin. Man falls into sin. And we immediately decline and drop. And we begin then to sit at this, again, horizontal line, which is well below that first line. We fall into sin. But then at some point, some yet future point, we are redeemed to the former state. That's John 3.16, redemption. That we are redeemed to the former state. So, the Bible teaches created perfect, fallen into sin, and again redeemed to that former state. Pretty basic and simple, really. The whole Bible, Old and New Testaments, is required to expound in detail this diagram. Now, I just said this is simple, and it is simple, but yet at the same time, it takes the entire Bible, the entire Old and New Testament, to expound upon this diagram. This diagram is nothing more than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it takes the whole Bible to explain from Genesis 1, to the fall of man, to Christ's sacrifice, and to the saints being reunited 
being reunited to that redeemed former state of being created perfect. So the first thing in the gospel is creation. Now most people when they teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, they head for the New Testament and they head for John 3.16. But if we're going to truly preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we need to go to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. The second is the fall. The second point is the fall of man. And the third is the plan of redemption. In these, we have a complete gospel. The gospel then does not consist of preaching John 3.16. The gospel of restoration to a lost state cannot be understood without a knowledge and being based upon a knowledge of the lost of state coupled with the fact of the fall therefrom. In other words, redemption cannot be understood without a knowledge of creation. Why do you need to be redeemed? Why go to heaven if you don't have an understanding that humanity fell and that we need a Savior to bring us back again? As the common saying among most people today, well, how are you doing? I'm good. They have no concept of perfection sin, and redemption. They're good. My Bible says there are none good but God. But this is the concept of this whole thing. In, order, in other words, redemption cannot be understood without a knowledge of creation. The two must be preached together and the second based upon the first. Redemption based upon creation. Creation is first and more important because it is the foundation upon which all other things are based. This gives emphasis to the importance of the Sabbath as the memorial of creation. The institution of God provided to preserve faith in creation and in Him as a personal God. The opposite conception of the origin of things without God by gradual development follows the line of a gradual ascent from a beginning in a mud hole up to some unknown ideal condition which man will theoretically ultimately reach of himself. The conflict between these two ideas may be diagrammed as follows, and I'm working on getting it. We have that first picture, created perfect, falling into sin, being redeemed to a former state, but then Laid over that, we have a diagonal line that starts low on the left and ascends at a straight line higher and higher. So it starts below the created perfect and it ends well above the redeemed to a former state. And that is the ascent, not descent, without God. In other words, that is the teaching of evolution. We start out in a mud hole and we end up being gods. And of course then there's the whole concept of that. The doctrine of man's continual ascent not only repudiates the fact of creation, but it ignores the fall, makes redemption unnecessary, releases man from obligation to obey a personal God, and absolves him from any coming judgment. Now I want you to think about what I just said. And think well. 
because most of the errors that are taught among Pro in Protestantism today, I just stated. I'll read this again for you in just a moment. Most of these errors that are out there that are prolific are taught among Protestant people. Now, I'm not talking just about your typical Laodicean that's going to church because that's what you're supposed to do. I'm talking about those who think that they have come up higher. Those who profess to have a profound walk with God and yet one of these often applies. I'll read the statement again. The doctrine of man's continual ascent, that's evolution, not only repudiates the fact of creation, but ignores the fall. So we have creation. How many Protestants do you know of that have rejected creation? What about ignores the fall? Or makes redemption unnecessary? releases man from the obligation to obey a personal God. There's two hid there. Obedience and God being a personal God. We'll look more both at those. And absolves him from any coming judgment. How many believe that there's a judgment? Not many. Some will put it way off and most just ignore it. Or as some teach, we're not being judged, God is being judged. Hmm. Prove that one from the Bible. So there's a lot of different errors here and they're among the majority. You, you might have to look closely because they're teachings might actually appear not to be that way. But the rubber meets the road. This is what happens. Our conception of sin is shaped by our conception of the perfect character from which we departed. Our conception of sin. You see, if we don't realize what perfection was, then our conception of sin doesn't look so bad. You see, if we look at it this way, and that is, if we have, and I have my left hand way above my head, and I have my right hand in the middle of my body. So if the higher hand is our perfection of what we once were before the fall, what humanity was, I'm saying, and we're down here in sin now, that looks like a long ways. But if we bring this down or bring this up with our religion, so that perfection and sin are so close together that there's hardly a step between the two, sin doesn't seem so bad. That's what the majority of Protestants do today. They pull those together, whether they bring the, the state of sinful man up or whether they bring the state of perfect creation down or bring the two together, they bring them closer so that their conception of sin is doesn't look so bad. And of course, then those humans, that's all of us, begin to compare ourselves among ourselves. Oh, I don't look so bad. I mean, look at brother or sister so-and-so. Look at the pastor. I saw him last week at the coffee shop. Or... All of these other excuses that we make as to why we don't look so bad. But as Christians, if we would set a high elevation of 
that perfect state that humanity once was and a very low elevation of what sin is we would see how far we have fallen and we would realize what it's going to take to get us back. Our conception of sin is shaped by our conception of perfect character from which we departed, with which man was endowed at creation, which was, like, was a likeness of the character of God. Thus, a knowledge of sin depends upon a knowledge of creation and belief in a personal God. There can be no sin and no conception of sin without a personal God. If there be no sin and no knowledge of sin, there is no gospel, no redemption, and no Redeemer. And also, by the way, no John 3.16. The whole Bible becomes a myth. Do you realize? I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about professed Christians. I'm talking about those that have separated into the hundreds, maybe thousands, I haven't counted, of different factions where all of these individuals have their, as I term, hobby horse that they ride. Doesn't matter which hobby horse they're on. Devil doesn't care as long as he can get them bouncing off into the ditch. If there be no sin and no knowledge of sin, there's no need of the gospel. There's no need of redemption. Definitely no need of a redemptor, a redeemer. The main object of the Bible must be then to reveal God that man may return to God. Man needs to see God's character as a person. Now, there's a whole lot of theological teachings going on out there right now about the Godhead, the, quote, Trinity. And one teaches one and thing and another another thing. One of the common denominators is they usually teach about an essence. And we're not going to take a lot of time looking at this essence thing today directly, but indirectly we will be looking at that. We may look at that one in a whole other study. But God, man needs to see God's character as a person. I'll show you why from the Word and also show you that it is as a person from the Word. Man needs to understand this because if we don't understand this, then we cannot understand the low level of sin. God sees, man needs to see God's character as a person in whose likeness he, that is man, was made that he may realize his present lost condition and that he may desire to be redeemed and so accept a savior and be restored once more to the presence of his maker. Those who know not God as a person turn naturally to some explanation of God or expression of God in the mysteries of nature, usually to the idea that the mysterious powers of nature are God and that therefore God includes everything, which is pantheism, the doctrine 
which holds that the self-existent and self-developing universe conceived of as a whole is God. Standard Dictionary. Pantheism. So in other words, what I'm short sharing with you, and we're going to go to our Bibles heavily in just a moment, but as I'm setting this study up, I want you to realize that if we believe that God is anything but a person, we will begin to turn to pantheism. You see, it works like this. Without a personality in the heavens or a personal God in the heavens, there is no love from above. There's no place for love to ascend. There's no exchange of love. There can be no gift of a son, no sympathy, pity, compassion, or mercy, no heart to feel, no ear to hear our prayers. The heavens will be brass over our heads, and we pray to ourselves. The first lie fulfilled. Ye shall be as gods. Genesis 3, 5. If we go with this concept that God is not a personal God, we also find this. There is no eye to see, no presence to deter from sinning or to sanctify, no hand to bless, no power to help, no desire to help us, no ideal to which we are to be lifted, no character after which to pattern, no assistance to reach it, and, and no presence with us. You see where this leads. If we do not realize, if we don't start from Genesis 1 verse 1 with the gospel message, we are left to ourselves. We have a religion that is nothing more than beginning in a mud hole and ending in self-exaltation. The first lie. But there is one to guide us, and we find him from Genesis to Revelation. But if we don't look there, we have no one to guide us, then we can do as we please and treat others as we please, and there will be no one to judge us. And that is the exact position that the majority of professed Protestants are in. And you may say, majority? You say majority? Let's go to our Bibles. Matthew chapter 25. Let's just take a quick look here. I want to show you that I am correct in saying the majority. Matthew chapter 25. And let's go to um, see if I can remember it here. I suppose my memory fails me on where it's at. I hate it when my mind does this to me. Um, few there be that find it. I thought for sure. I was thinking Ma Matthew 25, 6, but that's the wrong reference. Matthew 24, 14. Matthew 24, 14 says, For many are called but few are There you go. Matthew 24. Matthew 22, 14. 22, there we go. Matthew 22, 14. Matthew chapter 22, there we go. That's the text I was thinking of. Didn't have it in my notes, and my mind failed me. 
Matthew 22, 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. And Matthew 7, 14, I believe, is the, actually the one I was... Also Matthew, 20, verse 16. Matthew 7, 14, yes, yeah, Matthew chapter 7, verse 14 is the one I was specifically thinking of. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, I just made the statement, the majority of Protestants have this wrong foundation that they're building upon. And how I know that, it's not that I'm judging them. The Bible does. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. That doesn't, few is not the majority. Few is the minority. Few there be that find it. So there was, with this belief in a non-personal God, there was no one to guide us. We can do as we please and treat others as we please and there will be no one to judge us. Seventh-day Adventists even have thrown out the judgment. This is literally where all the Protestant churches of today have gone. A blending of the beliefs of the gospel and pantheism. Because the gospel, remember, is where we start out at perfect Christian perfection and we drop to a sinful state and we were redeemed to a redemptive state, of course, through Christ in that process. And the pantheism, evolution way, is that mud hole to self-exaltation. A blending of these two, a mixture of these two beliefs of the gospel and pantheism, of course that cannot work because the two are opposed, but they still begin to try to push them together, just like in the feet of the image of Daniel 7, the clay and the iron cannot be mixed together. It cannot work, for the two doctrines are directly opposed. So now let's go to our Bibles and let's take a look at the Bible picture of God. Let's find out if it truly is a person, if God is a personal God, and see how the Gospel reads. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Get your Bibles out. We've got a lot of Bible texts that we're going to spend some time going through. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens, heaven, and the earth. Now let's go to Genesis 1 verse 26. Genesis 1 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth." So in this text, the Father and the Son made man in their image, after their likeness. Let's go now to our next one, Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Second proof that we are made in the image of God. 
Now let's go to the New Testament, Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Are you ready? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by his prophets. Uh, wait a minute here. What's up with this? Um, oh, I read verse 1. Let's just keep going. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ is the image of his Father's person. And Hebrews tells us the express image of his person. In other words, the exact likeness. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Colossians 1 and verse 15, which says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So, in other words, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Christ is the image of the invisible God. Now, in Philippians 2, 6, Philippians 2.6, we see that Christ existed in the form of God. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I would hope that the next one we don't need to even turn to, but that we at least have that one memorized. John 3.16 God loved and God gave a gift to restore man. God loved and gave a gift to restore man. Now remember, as we talked earlier, sticks and rocks and stones and trees do not love. It takes a person to love. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Matthew 6, 19 to 30. Matthew chapter 6, 19, or 9, Matthew chapter 6, 9 to 13. Glancing at my numbers and saying the wrong thing. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 9. Jesus taught all men to pray, Our Father. Our Father. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Father. Are you beginning to see the personality of God? Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 16. 
Genesis chapter 16 and verse 13. Genesis chapter 16 and verse 13. God sees us. Again, a description of God. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Let's go to 2 Chronicles 16, 9. 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. His eyes run to and forth, fro, fro in the earth. A description of God. Now in Psalms chapter 18, we are going to find the eye of Jehovah beholds. He shows loving kindness and he will deliver from death and he will keep them alive. Therefore, we rejoice in him and trust in his holy name. Let's go to Psalms chapter 33. Psalm chapter 33. Psalm chapter 33 and starting at verse 8. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death, and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. So the eye of the Lord, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. Fear means to obey. Verse 19, to deliver their soul from death, to keep them alive in famine. Verse 20, he is our help and our shield. And then in 22, we see the call for mercy upon us. So God watches. He shows loving kindness. He delivers from death. And even keeps them alive in famine. Now, Psalms 139, Psalms 139, verse 1 through verse 18, his personality is revealed in every verse. Psalms 139, starting at verse 1. Going through verse 18, his personality is revealed in every verse. Here we go. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art a acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. 
Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? I as if I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wing of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me with my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the low, lowest parts of the earth." Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. O precious, O how precious, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Every verse reveals to us there the personality of God. He cares for us. We are fashioned in His image. Now let's go a step further and look at Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 1, and there we're going to find a description of God's throne. Ezekiel chapter 1, and we want to go to verse 26. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins, even upward, from the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Appeared like the firmament. But did you catch, it says, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man upon it. Let's go now to Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel chapter 10. And we want to go to verse 10, Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse 10. As then we're still looking at the throne. And as for their appearance, they four had one likeness, as a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. Now this will make more sense in just a moment, and it will, we'll come back to it, and you'll see 
this is part of God's throne. So another description of his throne, let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And verse 22, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 22. And he that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. So we see that this throne of God as a description, is in heaven. Now let's go over to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, we'll go just a little further on this picture, word picture that we are building here. Acts chapter 7 and verse 49. Acts chapter 7 and verse 49. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Heaven is his throne, he states. Now let's go to Daniel and bring this throne subject together. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Now I want to jump down to verse 19. Daniel 7 verse 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, devoureth, break in pieces, and stamp the residue with his feet. Now let's go back to verse 13. I, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is ever an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So one like the Son of Man, so verse 7, or, or chapter 7, verse 9, says, shows the Ancient of Days did sit, thrones were cast down, by the way, this is referring to judgment. And one like the Son of Man came in the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days who had sat. This is, as we've been studying the prophecies, this is a description of the fulfillment of the 2300-day pro prophecy. So we have here now the descriptions of the throne, and we have the wheels, the flaming fire in his wheel, verse, verse 9 here, and his wheels as burning fire, and Ezekiel 10.10, 10, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. So his throne has some sort of a wheel system on it, a wheel within a wheel. And we could study that for a whole study, but we're going to keep moving on because we're looking at the character of God, the personality of God, and His government. Let's go now to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. And in Revelation 21, we're going to see that he shall dwell with men, and they shall see his face. 
So Revelation 21 actually tells us, 21 verse 3 tells us that we will dwell, that He, that God will dwell with men. And then we're going to jump over to 20, chapter 22 verse 4 and about His face. So here we go, Revelation 21 and verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of the heavens saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And then over to verse, or chapter 22 and verse 4. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now let's go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40. I'm not giving you much comment here. We're just making a Bible word picture of the character, God's character, Isaiah chapter 40, and looking specifically at verse 28. And here we're going to see that he is set forth as the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, who fainteth not, neither is he weary, who giveth power to the faint, or to the weak. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. The creator of the ends of the earth fainteth not, neither is he weary an everlasting God. Let's go to Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16. And from here we're going to learn that the Lord hears the word of his saints, and their words are written before him, and they, that is the saints, will be spared in the day when he discerns between the righteous and the wicked. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son, that serveth him. Now let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose name is mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, a personal God. Thus the Bible, from the beginning to the end, presents God as a person, as a personal God. It is only as God is revealed as a personal Almighty being that men can have confidence in and trust in Him. Therefore, God must be revealed. In no other way can men be led to Him. He must become known not only as a person, a mighty, but so lovable that those who know Him cannot remain away from Him but will be drawn 
to him like a child to its mother's arms. No one will ever really serve him from any motive other than love of his principles and character. Not just love, not just a pharisaical, spiritualistic love, but a love that is founded upon God's principles and upon His character. But how do you know what His character is if you don't believe that He is a personal God? You cannot. And therefore, you will love Him with a spiritualistic love and He will say, I never knew you. It's by God's rules that we will enter that kingdom. Principles, His principles, and His character. Let's go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and verse 3. John chapter 17 and verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That they, that's us, might know thee, that's the only true God. That's what the plan of redemption is all about. But if we don't start at Genesis 1, we will have a lopsided, flat, maybe an elevated line from a mud pit to self-worship, gospel. Let's go over to or back to John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 32. John chapter 12 and verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus Christ died to redeem man. We have started out being created perfect in the image of God. And then man, humanity, fell. And Christ came to fallen humanity to live and to die, to prove that God's law can be kept and to make a way possible so that we can again be brought back up to that original state. Oftentimes, God is brought out as this mean, hateful, violent ruler. But think about it this way. God sent His Son to live the abuses of sinful man on this planet. He sent them here, Him here, to live and to be crucified in the most horrible possible method that man could invent. That's a God of love. But if we are to love Him, it is not, it cannot be in our way. It has to be by His rules. It has to be because He is a personal God in our mind and we want to be like Him. Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw. The invitation's there. The invitation is there, but what will we do with it? 
Are we so busy inventing and looking for some new thing in Protestantism that we will be able to think that we have heaven and yet turn away? Let's go to Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter one, Second Peter, chapter one, and starting at verse two. Second Peter, chapter one, starting at verse two. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of our God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and goodness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. The knowledge of God. The gospel can be understood and received only through a knowledge of God the Father. Now I want to go to some inspired comments. As you have noticed, I have not quoted from the Spirit of Prophecy as of yet. But we're now going to spend a few moments looking at it from that perspective. Ministry of Healing, page 409. A knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education and of all true service. It is the only real safeguard against temptation. It is this alone, that is the knowledge of God, that can make us like God in character. That's what we've been talking about for more than the last hour. A knowledge of God. If we have a wrong concept of God, we will have a wrong religion. A knowledge of God. The true education. This alone can make us like God in character. Ministry of Healing, page 425. The knowledge of God as revealed in Christ is the knowledge that all who are saved must have. It is the knowledge that works transformation of character. This knowledge received will recreate the soul in the image of God. It will impart to the whole being a spiritual power that is divine. Testimonies, Volume 8, page 264. Testimonies, Volume 8, page 264. In the creation of man was manifest the agency of a personal God. When God had made man in his image, the human form was perfect in all its arrangements, but it was without life. Then a personal Self-existing God breathed into that form the breath of life, and man became a living, breathing, intel intelligent being. All parts of the human organism were put in action, the heart, the arteries, the veins, the tongue, the hands, the feet, the senses, the perceptions of the mind, all began their work, and all were placed under law. Man became a living soul. Through Jesus Christ, a personal God created man and endowed him with the intelligence and power. Healthful Living, page 296. Healthful Living, page 296. Those who think they can obtain a knowledge of God aside from his representative, Christ would Christ, Jesus Christ, would be God's representative, correct? Jesus Christ came to this earth, 
So those who think that they can obtain a knowledge of God aside from his representative whom the world declares is the express image of his person will need to become fools in their own estimation before they can be wise. Christ came as a personal savior to this world. He represented a personal God. He ascended on high as a personal Savior and will come again as He ascended into heaven, a personal Savior. Wow. Now we see why God wants humanity again restored. Ministry of Healing, page 413. Ministry of Healing, page 413. God's handiwork in nature is not God Himself in nature. Do you understand that? God's handiwork in nature is not God Himself in nature. If you believe that, you are a pantheist and you will not be among God's people. Continuing the quote, The things of nature are an expression of God's character and power, but we are not to regard nature as God. The artistic skill of human beings produces very beautiful workmanship, things that delight the eye, and think these things reveal to us something of the thought of the designer. But the thing made is not the maker. It is not the work, but the workman that is counted worthy of honor. So while nature is an expression of God's thought, it is not nature, but the God of nature that is to be exalted. Now I find this one very revealing. Let's go back to our Bibles for just a moment. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to start at verse 18. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Being understood by the things that are made. God put nature on this earth, the trees, the animals, the leaves, the plants. It was all placed there to show us the Creator. But then as sin came about, and as man fell to the depths of degradation, God realized that it was going to take more than the nature that He had created to show His image to us. And so He sent His own Son, who is in the image of God, to be with us because he knew that we needed more to see the image of God, for that image to be revealed. He sent his Son to make him known in a world where the right conception of him was well nigh lost. Christ came to teach human beings what God desires them to know. 
Testimonies, Volume 8, page 265. Testimonies, Volume 8, page 265. Christ came to teach human beings what God desired them to know. In the heavens above, in the earth, in the broad waters of the ocean, we see the handiwork of God. All created things testify of His power, His wisdom, His love. Yet not from the stars or the ocean or the cataract can we learn the personality of God as it is revealed in Christ. Ministry of Healing, page 419. Ministry of Healing, page 419. God saw that a clearer revelation than nature was needed to portray both His personality and character. He sent His Son into the world to manifest so far as, as could be endured by human sight the nature and attributes of the invisible God. Review and Herald, October 26, 1897. Review and Herald, October 26, 1897. Watch closely. Christ gave His followers a positive promise that after His ascension, He would send them His Spirit. Go ye therefore, He said, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, now I'm going to quote, I should have said this before I started. I am going to be quoting Review and Herald, October 26, 1897, paragraph 9 for details. I'm quoting it word for word, nothing changed, nothing added. Go ye therefore, he said, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in brackets, a personal God, and of the Son, in brackets, a personal Prince and Savior, and the Holy Ghost, in brackets again, sent from heaven to represent Christ, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Matthew 28, 18, or 28, 19, and 20. So we have here Ellen White giving a clear, distinct definition. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, and she added, a personal God and of the Son, and she added, a personal Prince and Savior, and of the Holy Ghost, and she added, sent from heaven to represent Christ. It's not Christ, it's His representative, teaching them, that's us, to observe all things. This is not a pantheistic religion. This is a doctrine, a pure doctrine, that God wants us to see that He has sent personal representatives all through time. What is your choice? Who do you worship? the Creator or the created. Because the clearest revelation of God was in Christ, we are to continually and diligently study His life to know God as a personal, loving Father who has spoken to us in His book. The Word of Truth, the book, the only place where we can find. But remember, if we start out on a false premise as to who God is and His personality, we will then read this book and come to wrong conclusions. The only way that we can obtain a correct understanding of the things He expounds in the book is when we hear them from Him. Then, as we daily behold Him, 
we will lose, or we will desire, excuse me, we will desire more and more to be like Him and will gradually be transformed into the image that we behold. Therefore, our purpose in studying the Bible is not to know history or biography or doctrine or charts or the way as we started out from Jerusalem to Jericho, but to find and know a personal God, a personal Father, to see and love and to accept Him, to meet a personal Savior. We are not to study the book merely, but its author. And I'm going to finish with this thought. It's a little poem that I have found that I want to share with you. It's titled Truth, and it states this, Truth has been crushed so many times, then left to languish and die. So many times has wrong been crowned, and faithful souls have given a sigh. Truth might be crushed ten thousand times before earth's final day has come, but when the last returns come in, truth will be crowned the winning one. God kept truth. She cannot die. Tis but a fool who will rejoice when truth is beaten to the ground and wrong becomes the people's choice. Take heart then, faithful ones, today. Should wrong be placed upon the throne, truth is the protege of God, protege of God. He will not fail to keep his own. In the image of God, we were made long ago with a purpose divine. Hear His glory to show, but we
such a Savior I'll praise to the end of my days as I upward, onward trod in the image of God. A personal God. Let us seek Him in prayer as we close. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before You praising You that today You have opened our understanding that without a personal God in our lives, that we have no part of salvation. Let us each one evaluate where we stand. Let us evaluate ourselves. What is the true foundation that we build off of? May the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the word from Genesis 1 to Revelation to the end of it, may we each one see our Lord and Savior, our God and Father, who has done so much for us. As he watches us, may we see him in perfection, that we may become like him. Lead us forth, each one unto righteousness, is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.